All right, so now we're going to continue our discussion of protein function, and we're going to get a little bit deeper into uh, hemoglobin and transport of oxygen, release of oxygen, and everything like that. Uh, or not release of oxygen, but everything that is involved with the transport of oxygen, oxygen and what it's used for. So protein function part two. Carbon dioxide is an allosteric effector of hemoglobin. So just as we talked about oxygen being an allosteric effector, um, carbon dioxide has two effects. One, carbon dioxide diminishes oxygen binding by decreasing pH. Let me make sure that nothing, nothing, okay. Just want to make sure I didn't accidentally plug my computer, and I didn't, but I did trip everything up there. Uh, carbon dioxide diminishes oxygen binding by decreasing the pH, so making a more acidic environment. So that increases or augments, enhances the Bohr effect. Now, part of respiration is the production of CO2. The CO2 diffuses from the tissues to the capillaries. And hydration of CO2 in tissues and extremities leads to proton production. And the way that's exhibited and observed is by CO2 reacting with H2O produces HCO3 minus and a single proton. The hemoglobin also acts as a CO2 transporter. Okay, so CO2, ultimately, these are the two things that CO2 does. Um, hemoglobin binds to it to transport it out, but then CO2 also uh, is going to be hydrated to produce a hydrogen ion. So that's the way that it's going to basically increase the Bohr effect by producing this HCO3 in a proton. Now CO2 plus H2O yields H plus and HCO3 minus. In erythrocytes, an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase greatly accelerates that reaction. So take that to mean that this reaction happens, but there are also biological agents that accelerate, make it happen quite a bit faster. Now, looking at a figure like this, I think that it's important to kind of break it down in two different components. I would look at the top half of this graph or top half of this figure, and then um, once you have a good understanding of that, look at the bottom half of it. With that in mind, if this figure is kind of tough to wrap your mind around, we're going to look at it in a couple of different ways as well in just a moment. So carbon dioxide produced by catabolism enters erythrocytes. So when we're breaking sugars down, that catabolism is sugar breakdown. That CO2 is going to enter an erythrocyte, and the enzyme carbonic anhydrase is going to take CO2 and H2O to produce HCO3 minus, H plus, and that HCO3 is going to be transported out, and Cl minus is going to be transported in. And the reason and the purpose of this is basically this bicarbonate, this HCO3 minus dissolves in blood plasma. So that can be, you know, can enter the bloodstream and be gone. Um, now, in the lungs, what's going to happen? That HCO3 that is in the bloodstream is going to be able to enter from a, from the blood plasma, it's going to be able to enter this erythrocyte in the lungs. And the way that it's going to be able to do that is Cl minus is going to be transported out. Now, what this is going to, or the value of this is this carbonic anhydrase plus a proton plus HCO3, we're going to be able to produce H2O, we're going to be able to produce a CO2. And that CO2 is going to exit the erythrocyte and it's going to be exhaled out. Now, the accumulation of CO2, say here, is going to cause the pH in the blood to decrease because carbonic anhydrase, whenever it sees CO2 and H2O, it's going to react them to make bicarbonate and a proton. Now, O2 depleted muscles generate lactic acid, <clears throat> thereby lowering the pH 
of the blood passing through them. These protons are taken up by hemoglobin as that oxygen ultimately dissociates. CO2 being transported. So this is basically part one. CO2 diminishes oxygen binding by decreasing the pH. That's what's displayed here. Now, what else does CO2 do? Well, CO2 is transported through a mechanism known as carbamation. Hemoglobin acts as a CO2 transporter. Sure, while some HCO3 minus, or this bicarbonate, is carried in the blood, part of it binds to the N-terminal amino groups of the subunits to form, form carbamates. So here is the N-termini of hemoglobin. That is going to react with CO2. And in order for that to react, what's going to be released but a proton. That proton is liberated, which again augments and enhances the Bohr effect. But when that happens, the CO2 jumps on the N termini. This is known as a carbamation. The reaction aids in the transport of CO2 to the lungs. It also increases the Bohr effect by releasing protons. The bound carbamates can also form ion pairs, stabilizing the structure of the deoxy state. Okay, now this figure that is shown below is the figure that I, I think that I favor. So, okay. Now, when you're looking at a figure like this, it's important to find a starting place. And the starting place that I like is right here, the inhalation. When you inhale, oxygen goes into your lungs. The pressure of O2 in your lungs, or the concentration equivalent of O2 in your lungs, is about 100 torr. Now, in your alveoli, there's blood that's going to come in, in, in a very oxygen-rich environment, and free hemoglobin is going to bind O2, making HbO2. That HbO2 is going to be transported and be delivered ultimately to the muscle, where that HbO2 will release O2 because our PO2 is 20 tor, our O2 concentration is very low, and that O2 will be bound by myoglobin. That myoglobin will be oxygenated, that oxygenated myoglobin will basically just be there temporarily until that myoglobin or that oxygenated myoglobin releases that O2 so that it can be used as a part of cellular respiration. So breakdown of sugars. Breakdown of sugars. So that O2 that is brought from the lungs released in the muscle, held temporarily by myoglobin, then released whenever cellular respiration was ready to take place, is going to yield carbon dioxide and H2O. That carbon dioxide in the muscle isn't particularly helpful. However, in the bloodstream, we have carbonic anhydrase, which will take CO2 and H2O to produce HCO3 minus. That proton that is produced as a result of this reaction of carbonic anhydrase will go on to be added to hemoglobin, making a protonated hemoglobin. That protonated hemoglobin is still in the bloodstream, and what it's able to do is then, whenever we're getting closer to the lung, so we're moving left, excuse me, moving leftward, that protonated hemoglobin will release a proton, that HCO3 that's still in the bloodstream will pair up with that proton and carbonic anhydrase to release H2O and also release CO2, which CO2 can then be delivered to the lungs where it can be exhaled out. So basically the, the way that I like to think about this is, so from the left, starting at the bottom, moving from the left to the right, 
And when they're in the lower right hand portion of it, moving the moving upward to the upper right hand, then moving from the upper right hand to the left hand side to the upper left hand portion of this figure. That's where I like to that's the sequence that I like to follow. Now within here, it's important to remember that, well, there are still some things that are going on. And if you remember those some things that are going on, you'll have a good sense of what this process consists of. And I think this does illustrate quite a bit of the complexity of biological systems where you might have two to three things going on at the same time. Now, things that are essential for this is O2 is abundant in the lungs. Oxygenation is going to favor the R state. Oxygenation has the effect of releasing a proton. Releasing a proton shifts the equilibrium from bicarbonate to CO2 and H2O. CO2 can then be expired after it's all said and done. So that's a kind of quick and simple way of explaining this figure. I like the slightly more thorough way that I did it. Okay, so another way of looking at the, the Bohr effect and how that relates to all of this is we have this oxygen binding curve here. Again, we have that sigmoidal shape. If you look at the the line in the middle, that line in the middle corresponds to our so-called normal conditions. Uh, it's kind of a purple pigment. Um, and what this shows is that we move to the right when our hydrogen ion concentration is increased or our pH is decreased, our CO2 concentration is increased, and when the temperature is increased. We move to the left when our pH or our hydrogen ion concentration is decreased, therefore our pH is increased. When our CO2 concentration is decreased, and when we're at a lower temperature. The formation of HCO3 minus releases more protons. The reaction with hemoglobin releases more protons, and favoring the deoxy or T state, promoting the release of O2 and binding of CO2 is what's taking place. Now, effectors of hemoglobin that we've talked about, oxygen. Oxygen encourages, oxygen is an allosteric effector. It encourages the uh, binding of more oxygen. Carbon dioxide is an effector that really leads to release of O2. Now, this third effector that we're going to talk about is a molecule known as bisphosphoglycerate. Bisphosphoglycerate is purified hemoglobin, or sorry, bisphosphoglycerate is a molecule also known as B23 bisphosphoglycerate. One thing that I'd like you to think about is this ATE suffix. That's the that's generally going to indicate we're dealing with an ion, an, an anion at that. It's a naturally occurring compound. Bis phospho. We've got two phosphate groups on there, and they're on carbons two and three respectively. The purpose of this molecule is to modulate hemoglobin's affinity or oxygen affinity by preferentially binding to the deoxy form. Now, bisphosphoglycerate, if we look at the bottom here, it's this molecule in the center. Now, remember whenever I was talking about the T state and the R state of hemoglobin, we had that central cavity. And that central cavity in the R state was, was blocked off by, I think it was a histidine residue, whereas in the T state, it was much more open. Well, 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate is a molecule that basically inserts itself into the center of that uh, almost the tectonic plates or the or the plate the, the places where these different subunits of hemoglobin come together and it binds in that central cavity has an overall negative five charge and that negative five charge interacts with a handful of different amino acids it interacts with two different lysines four histidines and two n termini so these five negative charges are going to interact with a large number of different positive charges. And what's that effectively going to do? Well, it's going to lock our protein into that T state. So bisphosphoglycerate, I, I always kind of think about it as it serves as a mechanical block by inserting itself into that spot. But then it has the establishes the eyes, these ionic interactions that further stabilize its place in the center there. Now to illustrate how bisphosphoglycerate impacts oxygen binding of hemoglobin, we have this graph right here. 
And what I want to stress to y'all is that this graph, there's a lot going on here. The first line that I want to draw your attention to is this one right here for strip team equipment. This guy right here. So this is someone that has purified hemoglobin and they've done studies of, well, in a, a um, in a buffered solution, what is the P50 for strict hemoglobin? So this hemoglobin has heme and that's about it in it. Um, it's a very reduced, you know, I mean, like reductive, uh, not a complex environment that it's in. It's got a P50 of about, you know, 12 tor or so. Okay, then what happens when we add CO2 to that hemoglobin? That's where this line comes in, where I just drew this X. What do we see? We see that in the presence of CO2, our stripped hemoglobin has an increase in its P50. That P50, I would say that's maybe like right about here. So that's like 18 tor. Okay, so the addition of P50 should, should shift our O2 binding curve to the right. Next up is hemoglobin plus just bisphosphoglycerate. That's not hemoglobin plus CO2 plus BPG. That's just B BPG. And we get this line right here. Okay, well, our P50, it's shifted even further to the right. So what that means is we could compare line A to B and A to C. And what we get from that data is that bisphosphoglycerate has a greater impact on increasing the P50 of hemoglobin, of stripped hemoglobin, than does CO2. Okay. Interesting. Now, the last line, this last black line that I'm going to indicate right here, is hemoglobin, bisphosphoglycerate, and carbon dioxide. Okay, so now we're dealing with a, a little bit more complex of a situation. We've got bisphosphoglycerate and carbon dioxide. In combination, they're going to shift our curve farther to the right. So they're working kind of in tandem, which indicates that, you know, if you were curious, they're not doing the same thing in terms of where they're interacting with hemoglobin, uh, or they're unlikely to be doing the same thing, interacting with hemoglobin in the same space. Um, but they both, they kind of have additive effects. Now, the last line is this red line right here, which is written as whole blood. What that indicates is that someone took a blood draw from a person and they said, what does hemoglobin bind to? What's the, what's our P50 of hemoglobin when our, yeah, what's our P50 of hemoglobin in this whole blood extract? So it's not purified. It is not removing any of the bisphosphoglycerate or CO2 or anything else. Instead, this is just asking, is there something else? Is there something in addition to CO2 and BPG that causes or that, you know, gives a different result of our, our P50? And what you can see there is that the line of BPG and CO2 and hemoglobin is almost on par with the line of whole blood. Now, I would say that the whole blood has a P50 that's slightly higher. So there's potentially something else that impacts um, the P50 of, of hemoglobin in whole blood, but it's a very minor difference. But this also just sort of illustrates that you kind of can reconstitute the system. Um, BPG and CO2 are your big uh, impactors for uh, hemoglobin's oxygen binding ability. Now, PG, just looking at it like this, there's to me this looks like, oh, well, BPG is bad. Done. What it does is it locks the protein in this T state, and the T state is bad because I want the, the oxygen that I breathe into my body to go to my tissue so that my muscles can work and this and that. Bisphosphoglycerate, bad. Well, that's a very simplistic view of what bisphosphoglycerate does and how it impacts and the significance of the T-state. So this figure over here on the right shows the impacts of bisphosphoglycerate and living at high altitude or being at high altitude. So atmospheric pressure decreases with altitude. 
In the short term, your body can increase the production of bisphosphoglycerate. And under normal condition, delivery is re uh, of under normal conditions, about 38% of O2 is delivered to tissues. When the atmospheric pressure is lower or in low atm atmospheric conditions, only about 30% of O2 is delivered to the tissues. So if I can bring this up, what we're looking at is this right here and this right here at this point in time. 38% of your O2 that you inhale gets to the tissues, whereas at a high altitude, only about 30% gets to the tissues. Now, when phosphoglycerate increases, you can deliver about 37% of the needed O2 to the tissues. So ultimately, the significance of this is quite profound. So the important takeaway of a graph like this and the important takeaway of bisphosphoglycerate is that at high altitude, what happens is more of the O2 is unloaded at, sorry, more of the O2 is, un, O2 is unloaded from hemoglobin than when you're at sea level. So this, this 0 0.37, that 0 0.37 is an indicator of the amount of O2 that's unloaded at a higher altitude. So bisphosphoglycerate is not inherently bad because the body is going to release less O2, but, or, sorry, at high altitude, it's going to release less O2 in the absence of bisphosphoglycerate, but bisphosphoglycerate is going to cause hemoglobin to release more O2 to the tissues than it otherwise would. Now, one very important thing is that you need to be able to look at an oxygen binding curve and kind of process the information that it's giving you. Um, if it if this curve depicted here as green or red, if it shifts to the right or a shift to the, the right from the black line in the middle going towards the red, well, that is going to be a shift towards the T state. That's going to be a shift to release O2. Bisphosphoglycerate, CO2, and protons can all do that. Now, a shift to the left is a shift to stabilize the R state. O2 can do that. A slightly more basic environment indicated by this OH minus and different forms of hemoglobin can lead to that movement to the left. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stop here and I'll catch you in the next video. Have a good